I bring the uh, friendly greetings of the British people to the people of the British Guiana. Britain's colonial secretary, Duncan Sands, arrives in British Guyana in July 1963, bearing smiles, promises and a guiding hand. Independence was looming for the South American colony and he had helped organise a conference in London to smooth the path to statehood. Previous conferences had collapsed without agreement, but this time hopes were high. When it got underway on October the 22nd, 1963, the Times reported... The British Guyana Independence Conference, which was adjourned on November the 6th, 1962, reconvenes today at Lancaster House. Each of the three parties in the legislature is represented by four delegates. Dr Jagan, the Premier, leads the delegation from the People's Progressive Party, which forms the... Earlier attempts at reconciling Premier Dr Chedi Jagan and opposition leader Forbes Burnham hadn't gone well. But Sands clearly had faith in his plan to resolve the deadlock. And I have a document here that shows just what that plan was. Marked top secret and dated October the 7th, 1963, just two weeks before the conference, it's a record of a meeting in the Colonial Secretary's office. It was important to ensure, both at the conference and in the meantime, that Dr Jagan and Mr Burnham failed to agree either on the terms of reference or on the composition of any good offices commission. It was agreed that when the conference ended in deadlock, the British government would announce the suspension of the constitution and the resumption of direct rule. This document appears to show that the British government was setting out to deliberately scupper its own conference. Why invite already fractious political leaders to travel thousands of miles for talks that you've set up to fail? Such a move seems not only pointless, but would also delay independence. This at a time when colonialism had become a dirty word, and Britain was busy shedding most of its remaining vestiges of empire. The explanation for all this must surely lie in what was happening back in British dead. Guyana. The shops were barricaded against looters. Communications virtually ceased. Railway tracks acquired a derelict air as the strike entered its third month. Cars were abandoned... By 1963, the country was in a mess. Violence between descendants of former slaves from Africa and plantation workers from India was intensifying. Voting here tended to be along racial lines, with Indians supporting Prime Minister Chedi Jagan and Africans opposition leader Forbes Burnham. In April came a general strike. It lasted for 80 days and paralysed the country. The first issue of petrol brought tangled queues to the pumps. Indians and Africans jostled for their ration. Some cars had been... Guyana-born professor Clem Seacheron, head of Caribbean studies at London Metropolitan University, was growing up during the time of this turmoil and violence. By the early 1960s, you had um, nearly two to three years of virtual civil war. Riots, burning, looting, a general strike. The place was in turmoil. The Indians, of course, were hoping that this was the final hurdle, that the British, in spite of all the problems, that the British would give independence to Cherry Jagan. With the ongoing chaos and violence threatening to wreck plans for peaceful independence, the hopes of a nation rested on the Lancaster House Conference. Prime Minister Chetty Jagan, who led the People's Progressive Party, or PPP, was popular at home, having won the last two elections. Dr Jagan, a dentist by profession, seemed far from a threatening figure. Records from the day suggest he was personable and honest, and his PPP party spent much of its energies improving the lot of working people. Yet in a letter to Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, Duncan Sands wrote, and I quote, The sooner we get these people out of our hair, the better. Historian Dr Spencer Morby from the University of Nottingham says Britain had already tried to achieve that very goal a decade earlier. Well, Jagan came to power in 1953 as a result of elections. The People's Progressive Party won a victory in those elections. 
and the Churchill government at the time were the most concerned about Jagan's politics and the anti-colonial nature of his politics. So the history of Jagan is very much connected initially to his removal from power in 1953 after his first election victory. And that removal was quite dramatic, wasn't it, involving British forces coming all the way over and, and kicking him out? The pretext itself was dramatic because the British said that basically there was a plot to burn down Georgetown, which is a city of wooden buildings. Was there? Uh, there was no plot. And as you say, it was a dramatic intervention. British forces were put ashore and the Jagan government was forcibly removed from power and eventually Jagan himself was arrested and put in prison for a short period of time. But four years later, the nationalist Jagan was back. With socialist policies ever popular with the country's Indian majority, he easily won the 1957 election. By then, the British seemed to have decided that the self-proclaimed Marxist was a man they could work with after all. So, what caused this change of mind? I am concerned with the economic aspects of socialism. And my feeling is that this is the only thing that's going to solve a backward country's problems. And this is where I stand. Jagan has such a large following within British Guyana that he simply can't be ignored. So his story is quite similar to the story of a lot of the other independence leaders, Nehru in India or Kenyatta in Kenya, who are initially jailed but then are seen as somebody who becomes central to the process of achieving independence. Yet by the time of the Lancaster House Conference in 1963, Jagan was again out of favour with London. This, despite the fact that the doctor had won another fully democratic election in 1961. The British government seemed determined to ensure that Jagan's PPP wouldn't win another one. It was now backing the doctor's main political rival, opposition leader Forbes Burnham. Well, by 1963, it became a source of increasing debate within the British government because the Americans are pressing very, very strongly the notion that Chedi Jagan cannot possibly be allowed to become the president or the leader of an independent British guy. We understand we have records on Vietnam, on Cuba, the Berlin crisis. Freedom has many difficulties, and democracy is not perfect. But we have never had to put a wall up to keep our people in. But after those three incidents, our largest collection of records is on British Guiana. President Kennedy was obsessed with the independence movement in British Guiana and the fear that Chetty Jagan would come to power in a new independent Guyana, fearing that Chetty Jagan was going to lead Guyana down the road of a new Cuba or a second Cuba in the Western Hemisphere. So, at the root of it all was America's long-running hatred of anyone communist, particularly in their own backyard. In 1959, Fidel Castro had taken power in Cuba, and three years later, Washington was forced to face down the Soviet Union, which had tried to sight nuclear missiles there. And Jagan's attempts at diplomacy were swiftly rebuffed. Prime Minister Jagan came to the White House in October 1961, and they'd had a long conversation. Prime Minister Jagan thought that conversation had gone very, very well and thought he would soon be receiving economic assistance. After that conversation, President Kennedy decided that the Jagan government had to be overthrown. Once Kennedy had made his mind up, intense pressure was brought to bear on the British, particularly from 1962 onwards. I have here a copy of a letter written in that year by US Secretary of State Dean Rusk to the British Foreign Secretary Alec Douglas Hume. It sets out the US agenda in no uncertain terms. I have reached the conclusion that it is not possible for us to put up with an independent British Guyana under Jagan. The continuation of Jagan in power is leading us to disaster in terms of the colony itself, strains on Anglo-American relations and difficulties for the inter-American system. I hope we can agree that Jagan should not accede to power again. Cordially yours, Dean Rusk. So, when it came to British Guyana, America's disapproval of colonialism was evidently secondary to its horror of communism. Independence and democracy would have to wait until Marxist Jagan was no longer a threat. After receiving Rusk's letter, Prime Minister Macmillan fired off this angry response to Alec Douglas Hume. 
How can the Americans continue to attack us in the United Nations on colonialism and then use expressions like these which are not colonialism but pure Machiavellianism? Douglas Hume then sent a curt letter to US Secretary of State Dean Rusk. In response to his request not to allow Jagan to take power again, he pointedly wrote, How would you suggest that this can be done in a democracy? It had little effect. Washington even spelt out who London should support instead, opposition leader Forbes Burnham. Professor Stephen Rabe again. The underlying issue here is that Forbes Burnham is going to gain power. I have CIA documents in which they say that Chetty Jagan is far the better choice for Guyana, that he's honest, that he's not a racist, that he'll rule fairly, that he's a parliamentarian, and that Forbes Burnham is a highly dangerous person. Ultimately, all of this advice is rejected because of the fear of Jagan being tied to the international communist movement. But as 1963 wore on, American pressure on London grew and the CIA was brought in. President Kennedy agreed to give a certain amount of economic aid to Prime Minister Jagan, but unknown to Jagan, virtually every economic advisor that came in was a CIA agent. In addition, the United States began to work with the AFL-CIO, the American labor movement, funneling money in through the CIA into the AFL-CIO, and then they were fermenting strikes and demonstrations, which created more and more chaos within British Guiana. The general strike that by the summer of 1963 had brought British Guyana to its knees had, it seems, been both orchestrated and financed by the CIA. So it's a kind of long-involved process of internal subversion of the government of Jagan, making it seem almost ungovernable and thereby getting the Macmillan government to agree to the U.S. perception. Now, there's enormous resistance to this by the colonial office in particular. Gradually, the Foreign Office will come to the conclusion that good relations with the United States are more important than the future of British Guiana. So, in other words, to uphold democracy and avoid the possibility of countries going communist, it may be necessary to destroy democracy. That was the policy pursued, although no one would ever quite admit it to themselves. It was the personal intervention of President John F. Kennedy himself that finally sealed British Guyana's fate. On June the 30th, 1963, Kennedy arrived at Birch Grove, Macmillan's country estate. He basically issues an ultimatum to Prime Minister Macmillan in which he basically says that if British Guiana achieves its independence under Chetty Jagan, that will become a major political issue in the United States, President Kennedy will be defeated, there will be new fears of nuclear confrontation in the world, and surely, Prime Minister Macmillan, you don't want that to happen. And then one must remember that, at least from the Prime Minister's perspective and the Foreign Office's perspective, British Guiana is a problem. They would like simply to get rid of it. It's not an important colony. It's rife with chaos and, and dissension. We have to get out of this situation. So the combination of American pressure and its own self-interest convinces the British to cooperate. A decade earlier, Britain had sent in the gunboats. But with such colonial-style tactics ruled out this time, what would Macmillan do now? Prime Minister Macmillan at the end of September again writes back and says, all right, we're going to have a conference and Colonial Secretary Sands will impose a solution. And this is what we think will happen. We'll present the idea of proportional representation. Prime Minister Jagan will quickly decide that this is a way of depriving the indo guyanese majority of power. There'll be a deadlock and I'll impose a solution. So it's pretty much arriving at Lancaster. It's a pre-cooked solution. A month later, Duncan Sands was ready to put his plan outlined in our document into action. Dr Spencer Morby. This is Lancaster House where the colonial office officials, the colonial secretary Duncan Sands, the head of the People's Progressive Party, Chedi Jagan, the head of the PNC, Forbes Burnham, gathered in October 1963 in an attempt to resolve the disagreements which were ongoing in British Guyana. And it's quite a setting, isn't it? It's a gloriously luxurious room about a hundred meters long by about 20 30 wide it was obviously an important building for a very important occasion inside the imposing surroundings of Lancaster House Dr Morby and I read through Duncan Sands document so what we have here is a record of a meeting in the colonial secretary's room on the 7th of October 1963 and the third point that they mention is fairly explicit. It states, 
it was important to ensure both at the conference and in the meantime that Dr Jagan and Mr Burnham failed to agree either on the terms of reference or on the composition of any good officers commission. The idea that the conference had, would fail had been suspected for some time but this document proves that the British are actively engaged in making sure, in guaranteeing, if you like, that it does fail and that Burnham is encouraged not to compromise in any sense with Jagan during the course of the conference. With no agreement between the parties, thanks to help from Britain, the door was open for Sands to step in with his own solution. This consisted of dismissing all further talks between the country's political leaders as a waste of time. And in a selfless move, to prevent further delays for independence, Britain would decide their country's future for them. Sands then drafted a letter for the three leaders, which each would be invited to sign. Fearing that Dr Jaggin's team might get suspicious and advise their leader to reject the idea, Duncan Sands made an unusual request. Professor Clem Sicheren. On the fatal day, Duncan Sands, the colonial secretary, phoned Shelley Jaggin and said, I want you to come and I want you to come alone. I don't want you to bring any of your advisors. But Burnham and Peter Degas, the leader of the United Force, they were all there with their advisors. According to Professor Seacherin, things couldn't have gone better for Sands. When the men arrived at the meeting to find the letter laid out on the table, Jaggin was the first to sign. Bereft of legal advice, he didn't understand the implications of what he was signing. He signed a it was virtually a kind of a blank check. It gave the British a free ride now, that they could subvert him without having to suspend the Constitution. He was handing over power to adjudicate on all the contentious issues to one man, Duncan Sands, who was determined to get rid of him. A few days ago, I sent Sir Fenton the formerly top-secret document, which reveals how Duncan Sands intended the conference to fail. Sir Fenton had never seen this before. I couldn't really believe that my suspicions would one day have been proved so accurate. I couldn't really believe it. I suspected that this was the case. I thought this was the case, but I felt that I could have been wrong. But in the events which occurred, I wasn't wrong at all. Chetty Jagan, in one stroke, sign what amounted to his own political death warrant. He said he felt that he could not go back to Guyana, or to British Guyana, without a date for independence. Jagan's daughter, Nadira Jagan Brancia. If he had returned home to Guyana without a decision on the date of independence, the opposition would have used that as an excuse to start up the riots that were done in 62 and in 63. Dr. Jagan, you can't agree with each other, but apparently you can with Mr. Sands. How come? Well, somebody has to decide ultimately, and I feel that the uh, British government has a responsibility to give British Guiana independence, and it must decide. Jagan was later to regret that decision, but it seems London couldn't have been happier. I have here copies of the minutes from a meeting on November the 26th, 1963, between the new Prime Minister, Douglas Hume, and Dean Rusk. The Prime Minister said that this had gone off slightly better than had hoped. It had even been slightly awkward that Dr Jagan had given us so little trouble. But why would such a passionate nationalist as Chetty Jagan give up so easily after years of struggling to free his country from its colonial chains? Winston McGowan, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Guyana. He had faith in British justice and he felt in the end that Britain would have done what was right. I mean, that was his bottom line and therefore he should be prepared to trust the British. Part of the agreement was that fresh elections would be held in 1964. Britain, which now had control of the country's constitution, ensured that these would not be conducted under the old first-past-the-post system, which had served Jagan's party well. With people of Indian origin making up two-thirds of the electorate, he had seemed set to win another outright majority. But now, under Britain's newly imposed PR system, victory for Jagan's PPP party was no longer assured.
Clem Seacheron was just 13 at the time, but he can still remember how his family, long-time Jagan supporters, reacted to the news. Certainly the Indians in British Guyana were extremely, extremely depressed by this because they knew it was the end of the road, that there was no way Jagan would win the elections. London was aware that Jagan's chances of winning the next election under the PR system were greatly reduced, but there was always the chance that the ever-popular politician might yet defy the odds. Documents show that to help prevent this happening, they planned to try and split his vote by creating and funding a new Indian party. It was reported that a Muslim party might soon be formed under the leadership of Hussein Ghani. The Secretary of State said that financial encouragement should be given to Mr Ghani and no questions asked. In Lancaster House, Dr Spencer Morby showed me that document. It's dated February the 25th, 1964 and marked secret. It's a note of a meeting with the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Duncan Sands. This is the one document which proves direct British intervention in the election in order to weaken the support of the People's Progressive Party and to make sure that however strong the support is for Jagan in the election that he doesn't have sufficient votes to form an overall majority under the new system of proportional representation and it demonstrates that the British were involved in manipulating the electoral process where they were supposed to be neutral arbitrators in the process. The document reveals that the British plan to channel the funds to the leader of the new Muslim party, Hussein Ghani. I showed this paper to Chetty Jagan's former Attorney General, Sir Fenton Ramsahoy. I was under the belief that his finances came from the CIA. It, for the first time I read that the colonial secretary was telling his people in his office that uh, he should be financially encouraged and no questions asked. That was the first time I knew that. So the British were in this even deeper than you thought? Oh, they were in it to the neck. They were in it to the neck. After the election of 1964, the British and the Americans had wagon was ousted. Under the new PR system, the opposition People's National Congress formed a coalition government with the United Force Party. In May 1966, the new man in charge of what was now independent Guyana was Forbes Burnham, long preferred by Washington to the Marxist Jagan, but a figure much less admired in London. Forbes Burnham, Prime Minister of Guyana, the newest and 23rd member of the Commonwealth. He leads into independence the three quarters of a million... Chetty Jagan boycotted the independence ceremony and spent the next 26 years in the political wilderness. So, how did Forbes Burnham, the man who replaced him, go down with the Guyanese people? Professor Winston McGowan. In his first 10 years, he did do a lot of positive things for the country. He expanded the educational facilities. He got involved in agriculture schemes, in irrigation, road building. But from 1968, he began to have a history of, of rigged elections. And a lot of us remember him for what happened in his last years. Apart from the collapse of the economy, there was said he became increasingly authoritarian. You had virtual kind of press censorship. Uh, we had massive foreign debt, and then we, we had shortages of basic food items. His last years were really a disaster for this country from almost every point of view. Some, like Sir Fenton Ramsahoy, have still to come to terms with what happened. Throughout the history, the colonial history of this country, and from the reports of every governor, they re always reported that Burnham was totally unfit to govern this country. So the Americans didn't mind that, so long as it could be used to keep Jagan out. And they allowed him to do whatever he liked, even if it meant the destruction of his country. And that's what hurt me most about this whole business. It's something that you, a feeling of bitterness with which you die. What about Britain and America? After all, their Machiavellian manoeuvres, did they really get what they wanted? Well, they did at first anyway, says Professor Stephen Rabe. 
Forbes Burnham makes an appeal to the United States and becomes supported by the United States, that he will pursue pro-Western interests, that he's a supporter of the United States in terms of civil rights in the United States. He initially backs the United States in Vietnam. In fact, he's, he himself is a socialist and begins to turn independent Guyana into a socialist state. Forbes Burnham's ideological drift continued to the point where he showed open support for Cuba's Castro. That compliment was reciprocated when the communist leader honoured Burnham with a special award. The Kennedy administration might have believed that what they did was for the greater good, thwarting communism at a vital time in the Cold War. In the end, it transpired that they, with Britain's help, simply swapped one left-wing leader for another, possibly worse one. It's something of which Professor Stephen Rabe, as an American, isn't proud. I'm a veteran of the Marine Corps. I consider myself a highly patriotic American. My blood runs red, white.